Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to yet another uh, enriching uh, webinar celebrating women scientists, celebrating women empowerment, celebrating women in industries uh, such as STEM industries. Um, it's such an honor to be with you today. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mariam Farag, and I am head of CSR at MBC Group. I am also uh, an advocate for women empowerment and um, giving platforms for women to share their views, to share their voice, and to share their aspirations and dreams for the future. Today, we are uh, celebrating Arab women scientists advancing scientific research amidst the pandemic. This is our webinar, and particularly closing and zooming onto uh, for women in science. Uh, an award that has been launched uh, in collaboration with L'Oreal Foundation and UNESCO, particularly today in partnership. This webinar is in partnership with She is Arab, a platform with a vision for Arab women to be presented equally in the global economy. Welcome. Before I start with my introduction, I will go through just um, housekeeping. Um, remarks. So we have, we understand that we have uh, Arabic speakers, non-Arabic speakers, but today the webinar is going to be uh, translated and uh, shared in Arabic later on. And I believe also that uh, we have Q&A in the designated section that you can write your questions and we will have a designated around 10 minutes in the end um, with a questions and answers session to engage with our esteemed panelists for today. For the seventh consecutive year, L'Oreal and UNESCO for Women in Science Middle East Regional Young Talents Program in partnership with Khalifa University of Science and Technology continues to recognize Arab female scientists from the GCC for their revolutionary research in the fields of life sciences, physical sciences, mathematics, and computer science. The regional program in partnership with of L'Oreal UNESCO's global initiative that has recognized over 3,400 phenomenal researchers since its inception 22 years ago. The L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Middle East Regional Young Talents Program is based on the belief that the world needs science and science needs women. With that said, and coming from the media industry, I believe that visuals speak, speak louder than words. I will leave you now briefly with a video, honorably and with pleasure announcing six women in science winners for 2020. Our world is a wonder to behold. Endless beauty, magnificence of no limits, reaching as far as the heavens and to the deepest of imaginations. For thousands of years and for all mankind, the world lived in elegance and thrived in grace. But today, more than ever, our world needs our help, for it is facing a battle, one that is not easily fought, but one which can be won, with the power of science alone. And as the world's brilliance fades, L'Oreal Foundation and UNESCO recognize those who are fighting to bring back its light. The women in science, whose achievements we've been celebrating for over 22 years worldwide. We proudly present the winners of L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Middle East Regional Young Talents Program 2020. Women who have a vision for a brighter tomorrow. Empowering us to diagnose the world's ailments and illuminating the cure for keeping our future beating. A 
and for being our first line of defense. L'Oreal Foundation and UNESCO salute these women who once more shed light on the majesty of our world, the real stars of humanity. What a remarkable video. Uh, it's actually sent shivered down my spine. We are celebrating women in science, women that are making a difference and creating impact, especially post pandemic, post COVID-19. We have seen amazing uh, frontliners uh, risk their lives to save others. And in fact, uh, uh, a few of them lost their lives saving other lives. And this is what we celebrate as well, the bravery of uh, women and men. I would like to mention once more that we have live inter, uh, interpretation in Arabic. Um, uh, I will continue now by introducing someone that has a, a remarkable uh, history and remarkable experience um, in, in this field particularly, and someone that has been working in the region for quite some time. Dr. Anna Paulini, UNESCO office in Doha, representative to the countries of the Gulf and Yemen, an architect and holds a postgraduate degree, degree in cooperation for development, as well as a PhD in urban and territorial engineering. Joined UNESCO in 1992 as specialist in the field of culture at regional office in Amman. From 1997, she covered several positions within the culture sector in headquarters in Paris, including being responsible of the museum section in charge of cultural heritage in the Arab region, as well as of the response to the second Iraq war. In 2007, she became UNESCO's representative and head of office in Uzbekistan, followed by Jordan. Dr. Anna, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Distinguished guest, uh, Dear women scientists, I mean, greetings and really welcome to everyone attending this virtual panel discussion, bringing together the network of L'Oreal and UNESCO for women in science family to support, to learn, to share knowledge and experience with prominent Arab women scientists present with us today. I'm really humbled to be with you this morning. Congratulations to the 2020 winners of the L'Oreal UNESCO Middle East Regional Young Talent Program. I wish you all, and we have seen in the video, such powerful young women, great success in your career. 20 years ago, UNESCO and the L'Oreal Corporate Foundation had launched the Four Women in Science Program to bring visibility to achievement of women researcher and to recognize their contribution in advancing scientific research to address today more pressing challenges. So far, this program has supported and raised the profile of 112 laureates, out of which five have received the Nobel Prize. And more than 3,400 talented young scientists, both doctoral and postdoctoral candidates from 115 countries. This year, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to a women duo. Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dudna for the development of a new technology for genome editing, making them the sixth and the seventh women to win a Nobel for chemistry after Marie Curie in 1911, and more recently, France Arnaud in, 19, in 2018. Both Charpentier and Dudna were the 2016 L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Laureate, which proves once again that the collaboration is key and critical to making progress and scientific advancement to tackle the environment, socioeconomic and health challenges 
that the global society is facing today. Despite their groundbreaking discovery and achievement, only 28.8 of the researchers are women, according to the 2018 UNESCO Institute for Statistics data. Globally, female students' enrollment is 8% in engineering, manufacturing, and construction, 5% in natural sciences, mathematics, and statistics, and it's particularly low in the ICT, representing only the 3%. These numbers are alarming and call for action to close the gender gap in science, technology, and innovation, and equip the future generation with adequate skills and competencies, and harness the power of emerging new technology, such as artificial intelligence, robotics, virtual reality, augmented reality, just to name few. Particularly in these unprecedented circumstances where COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted our lives, and more importantly, the education system impacting the learning of over 1.5 billion students globally, we need to bring to the forefront the vital contribution of all women and men in the field of science, technology, and innovation to decision-making processes and providing solutions that goes beyond national borders. Research and innovation are catalysts for achieving our goals to live in a healthier, sustainable, and prosperous planet. However, the world urgently needs more scientists to tackle the global challenges we are facing today. And we cannot afford to let half of the world population, which are women, unnoticed behind their remarkable achievements. Women, teachers, doctors, nurses, mother, researchers have been all on the front line and holding leadership position in the battle against COVID-19 outbreak. I'm therefore very honored and humbled today that we are joined by eminent women scientists from the Arab region we are also the jury member of and the winner of the and the winner of the L'Oréal UNESCO for Women in Science Middle East Regional Young Talent Program. This event is an opportunity to highlight their effort in helping mitigate the impact of the pandemic, but also to listen, to learn from them, to acknowledge the progress that they have made and the contribution that they have bring forward and the barriers that need still to overcome. We need you to stand up and become an inspiration for the young generation of women, the next scientist to be. So with, ha with having said so, I wish you really a successful event. I thank you all of you for being uh, online with us today, but I'm especially thankful to all of you scientists for really highlighting the importance that STEM had today and for encouraging the young generation of talents, of talents in the science, the young girls to be scientists of the future. So thank you very much and congratulations again to the winners of this 2020 year's award. Thank you, Dr. Anna. This is this was very inspiring and especially the last part where we want to inspire young girls to become part of this. I think it's a magical world of, uh, of science and discovery and research and finding solutions for humanity and um, uh, for, for our planet. It's, it's a magical world and I believe it's, it's wonderful. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists, women that I personally look up to. Um, we've had a few discussions and I, I felt that there's so much that um, I have learned and so much that the viewers will learn today from our uh, women in science. I will start with introducing our panelists first um, and giving you a small um, brief bio of their many achievements. Dr. Habiba Al-Safar, Director of Biotechnology Center, Khalifa University. She has a PhD in for Forensics and Medical Sciences from Western Australia. Um, she has an MSc in Medical Engineering from United Kingdom and a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from the USA. 
Her research interest is constructing the uh, genomic structures of individuals of Arab descent to identify genomic segments that carry genes that uh, predispose to disease. She is also a member of the UAE Science Council since 2016. Welcome, Dr. Habiba. We have next Dr. Yes. Maha al muzaini infectious disease scientist and educator at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. She's a scientist and head of, uh, and please uh, uh, forgive me for not uh, pronouncing this correctly, but immuno compromised host research and adjunctant associate professor faculty at the School of Applied Medical Laboratory Sciences, King Saud University. She has founded the first HIV AIDS laboratory within the kingdom, a scientific member in committees, both at a regional and global level. The latest being selected to participate in the coalition of uh, epidemic preparedness uh, innovations, scientific advisory committee in Norway. She's also a global funding institute to combat infectious disease. This is a global funding institute to combat infectious disease. She is an activist for HIV uh, and AIDS awareness and research. She is also an advocate for women empowerment in STEM research and innovation. Welcome, Dr. Maha. Last but definitely not least, Dr. Sabah El Haley, assistant professor for in immunology. I believe something that we really want to learn more about, especially these days, College of Medicine, Hamad bin Rashid University of Medicine and Health Sciences. PhD Experimental Medicine from Miguel University from Montreal, Canada. In January 2017, she has been appointed as Assistant Professor of Immunology College of Medicine uh, in Mohammed bin Rashid University of Medicine and Health Sciences in Dubai. In October also 2017, she was an adjunct professor, Faculty of Medicine, Miguel University, Montreal, Canada, um, 2017 L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Fellowship and 2019 also L'Oreal UNESCO International Rising Talents. Welcome, Dr. Sabah. I would like, before we start our questions, I would like to ask Dr. Uh, Habiba and Dr. Maha and Dr. Sabah to briefly introduce yourselves from your own self. Uh, we have we have read your bios, we have, um, you know, uh, got to know briefly about your professional uh, achievements, but if you can uh, introduce yourself and, and uh, give us a brief within a minute or a minute and a half, please. Dr. Dr. Habiba, we will start with you. If we can have you on the camera, that would be great. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Miriam, for the introduction. And I would like to congratulate also the winner for 2020. Um, and uh, as uh, Maryam mentioned, I'm Habib Al Safar, Associate uh, Dean for Student Affairs at the College of Medicine, and also Associate D um, Professor at the College of um, Department of Gene and Molecular Biology. I've been reading the Emirati genome for the past 16 years, looking at the genes responsible for type 2 diabetes. Um, to look at the early detection and also uh, plan uh, uh, or uh, you know manage the disease and prevent it, as you know genetic uh, testing can uh, prevent diseases by twenty percent. And also, I've been uh, trying to uh, promote science and STEMs in uh, young um, college students, uh, both gender, of course. And I've been teaching for now almost ten years. I taught almost. 2,500 students and it's been a pleasure. I have, I always say it, I have the best job ever. So that's me <laughs> and I love science basically. Thank you, Dr. Habiba. Uh, Dr. Maha, if you can introduce yourselves, please. You're muted, Dr. Maha, you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and uh, thank you for this invitation. 
Um, and I would like to congratulate the 2020 awardee and recipient for the uh, L'Oreal UNESCO Award. Um, there were amazing uh, fellows uh, and applicants. And most of all, I would like to thank the L'Oreal UNESCO Foundation um, to support women in science. Um, I am a scientist and basically um, a clinical researcher at King Faisal Specialist Hospital, where I established the immunocompromised host research unit. Um, and this um, unit focuses on studying the immunological and molecular uh, pathways of different immune suppressed population. So not only HIV, but in trans, any, any case of um, uh, immune suppressed uh, patients such as transplant, um, or other um, infectious uh, disease. Um, and basically, since we were the first HIV research lab, we're considered to, uh, we're proud of that. Um, yes, thank you. And now as the awardee of, for L'Oreal UNESCO in 2015. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maha. Dr. Saba, yes. welcome. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for inviting me today to be part of such a great panel of, of women. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here today. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate the six winners of the 2020 uh, L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science. And um, I actually have the privilege of knowing some of these um, outstanding women, and so I'm very proud of them. Um, I didn't know the names of the winners, so I'm really proud to see some of the girls that I actually know, and I know that they're going to go and do great things, inshallah. Um, so I, I think you basically said it all. Um, I'm an assistant professor of immunology at Mohammed bin Rashid University here in Dubai. I'm also an adjunct uh, faculty at McGill University, where I actually graduated from. I'm, my main area of, of research is the immune responses in various um, respiratory conditions. So um, I'm particularly interested in asthma but I also do research in lung cancer. And um, since starting my own laboratory, I've kind of taken a, a new interest in, in obesity um, and how obese, um, uh, obesity can really impact the, the immune system and have you know, very uh, big side effects on, on, on various components. And um, yeah, I'm also the 2017 awardee of the L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science in the Middle East. And in 2019, I was selected as one of the 15 uh, international rising talents. Um, and so I'm, I'm very honored to be here today. And thank you again for inviting me. It's our honor, Dr. Saba. And uh, I can see already the passion in, in, in your eyes and the passion in, in your voice when you talk about uh, finding solutions for asthmatic patients and finding solutions, especially for obesity. I believe that the GCC is suffering a lot with the 15 and under, the age 15 and under when it comes to obesity. And we will tackle this uh, topic more during the, the, the questions. I would like now to start with our, our, um, our discussion and uh, ask Dr. Habiba, you tackle the societal impact of the, 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 the current pandemic in your research, Dr. Habiba. Um, how is it going to, or how is it affecting our, our societies? And how will these um, effects last forever? Or are we going to overcome them? And I believe we have a slide here on the research of Dr. Habiba uh, lately. The floor is yours. Mariam. Yes, thank you, Mariam. Um, I can hear an echo. Okay. Um, of course, um, as you know, um, we are facing a global health crisis. And uh, to be honest with you, at the beginning, I was working with non-communicable diseases and like chronic diseases and diabetes. When the COVID-19 pandemic happened, it uh, gave us an opportunity to work with a lot of researchers and scientists in the UAE and also international collaborators to, to tackle this, this uh, pandemic or uh, to, to have kind of, you know, a research and put a lot of research questions and how to stop and help, um, uh, how to stop the transmission of this, this virus and also how to help the, the top management or leadership to make the right decision in, in terms of, you know, uh, stopping the transmission. Um, it's this 
pandemic affected a lot of you know aspects of our life of course it had education impact as a, i mean as a teacher uh, um, we had to go from a traditional lecturing and teaching to an online and think about different ways that we can uh, you know uh, deliver our lectures and keep continuous of the, the education and also there is a lot of you know, social impacts such as religion and a lot of people couldn't practice some of the re religions that we do um, yearly and um, um, not to mention a lot of, you know, elderly care and also many countries, they, um, they reported domestic violence and also people with disabilities they were suffering a lot of um, the impact so it happened. In terms of research, we a lot of events or let's say conferences, scientific conferences that we've been attending been uh, canceled or postponed and also, um, you know, it's impacted our research because this kind of events and conferences, it's give us an opportunity to network among other uh, researchers. Uh, so what we did during the pandemic, of course, we didn't uh, sit there and watch what's happening. No, we, we created it's kind of uh, called a collaborative um, uh, COVID-19 partnership or collaborations between different uh, local university like Sharjah University, UAE University, Saha, and also uh, Dubai Health Authority. We worked on a project um, that tackle or understand the virus and also understand the host uh, where the, the, the virus is entering the, the, the human body and also to see what kind of bacteria that it is. Dr. Habiba, you, you are muted. If you can unmute yourself, please, it would be great. I I'm not you muted. Were muted. You were muted for, for a few <laughs> seconds. If you can repeat oh, uh, the last part, please, if you don't mind, because we missed it. Sure. Uh, in terms of the virus, we sequence the entire genome of the virus. We find what kind of you know mutations happening in the UAE, uh, what uh, how many strain um, entered the Emirates of Abu Dhabi, and also uh, how can we. Um, you know, um, from the sequencing of the virus have a very uh, reliable, you know, the testing uh, PCR, which to detect which is a specific genes for COVID-19. And also uh, the sequencing of the virus helped us to identify the transmission, the places where it's a, it's a very viral, let's say, to transmit the disease, what kind of jobs that they, they transmit the disease. And also when we looked at the sequencing of the host, we, we identify or let's say, um, you know, kind of identify why some people they get it severe, some people they get mild or moderate and also asymptomatic where people they don't show any symptoms but they, they can transmit the disease. We looked at the ACE receptor, for example, when the virus entered the body. So there is a, a, a two genes that enter, um, you know, um, the lung uh, cells. So uh, the ACE receptor, we looked at, at our population, how different is it with the Asian population and Caucasian. We can see there is a big diversity, let's say, uh, in, the, in the Arab population in terms of I mean, comparing to the Asian and uh, African. We also looked at um, the microbiome genome, which is one of the study that, you know, been a very uh, niche in the area that we were the first, um, you know, entities to do it and look at what kind of you know food and what kind of uh, lifestyle the asymptomatic habit or healthy people who did not uh, develop the disease or did not get infected uh, for the past you know eight months and uh, the the results were very interesting and how also the bacteria in the guts help us to battle this the virus so so far we've been you know studying um, the virus the host and also we started the animal studies how the virus is, is um, transmitting from the animals and going to the human and also uh, what are you know the factors that make it more severe um, it's um, it's a lot of opportunity came out of this project as I said uh, the researchers 
came together to and uh, it was kind of one of the unique uh, collaboration between local university and international also we we gained the trust of the public and a lot of you know entities they looked into research in different uh, ways now and now a lot of you know people are putting there is an important role that research is playing in um you know tackling these all the problems or let's say to have a healthier um, future to have you know um the engagement of research institute with the government to make any decision uh, on, in terms of any pandemic uh, now or in the future, which give us a lot of opportunity. Challenges, I mean, there is challenges everywhere. One mm -hmm. of the challenges that we face as a researcher was, you know, because of the lockdown uh, and uh, as you know, in the Middle East, you know, the supply chain, the, 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 the getting the reagents from the Western countries and stuff, it slowed down, but it made us to think out of the box and we, it made us to think about to create or to have a manufacture of these reagents in the country. Um, uh, things went slow at the beginning, but I can see it's, um, it's becoming fast. Now we are getting things done um uh, we, we we there was an important you know a big role for the management or leadership in the university to think of uh, different ways to import these kind of reagents from you know either canada us singapore so we made a lot of deals with a lot of companies that we need to have a manufacturer in the abu dhabi that will you know fulfill the supply for example in, in the in the region also um if you know the genetic testing we didn't have a lot of labs that look at the genetic testing nowadays like you know from one lab now we have 17 labs which give us an opportunity to look in different diseases not just for coronavirus or diagnostic of the the, the let's say communicable diseases um opportunity i mean the challenges made it you know a kind of uh, opened an opportunity for us a research uh we gained a lot of lessons um from this um, event. And I hope that we will have more collaboration in local hospitals, more uh, collaboration with scientists, and we can do um, you know, a lot of research that we can publish in a very high impact factor. Thank you, Dr. Habiba. This was very uh, enlightening. In fact, I mean, I, I learned a lot myself and I'm sure the audience have learned a lot. Um, you said it uh, rightfully so. From challenges, we, we have many opportunities if we are focused and if we really look for the positive side and rather uh, not on the negative side, I'm conscious of time. Uh, I know that the organizers are flagging that it's 12.35. I am conscious of time. Um, however, uh, going back to the, to the discussion, the world, or, or I don't want to say the world, but a lot of countries in the region were looking to the UAE as, as pioneering uh, during the, the, the pandemic uh, when it came to uh, um, uh, the, the, the readiness and the, 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 the immediate uh, effect and the immediate um, uh, proactive approach to protect and to test a lot uh, throughout, uh, you know, throughout the crisis and even uh, until now. Um, I myself have been a resident of, uh, of the UAE for the almost 15 years and I felt, um, you know, it is my second home, but I felt extremely lucky to be here, uh, part of the UAE during the pandemic. But there are so many countries, and especially uh, developing countries, and and uh, and uh, you know the ones that we call poor countries, the ones that cannot afford massive testing and cannot afford to to uh, to allow um, their people to be tested or to be even given the right precautions, uh, even um, access to water. Uh, to clean water, in fact. Uh, Dr. Maha, your research has focused um, on COVID-19 testing and identifying uh, predictive markers for disease uh, se uh, severity and diagnosis. Uh, but what can you tell us about that, Dr. Maha? But also, I'm, I'm very particularly interested in how important is testing, especially in countries that cannot afford that. And we have seen in Africa, for example, people could not even afford to have masks, Dr. Maha. Um, uh, because of the, you know, the uh, poverty situation over there. And why is it essential to identify predictive markers for any disease? Um, I hope I did not uh, confuse you, but um, we are very interested, in fact, in, in this particular topic. The floor is yours, Dr. Maha. 
These are really great questions. Thank you. So um, during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, the early pandemic crisis, when it all started, um, the research center here was focused on many different questions to answer many different aspects. Um, and we have different teams, different departments, different specialities to answer those. And um, my team, our team, which is the immune compromise, were, um, uh, were trying, our efforts was to establish testing. And why is that? Because as you mentioned, uh, the early signs of uh, the virus showed that it is transmitted in, in a very high uh, levels. So in order to uh, cut down or stop the cycle of the virus spreading, you need to do testing. The more testing that you do, uh, the better to identify the cases, you then you isolate them, treat them, and, 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 and you break that cycle of the viral transmission. So our efforts was to establish a, a mode of um, um, in-house testing, viral testing, as a backup diagnostic test when it's needed, uh, when it's needed for our institute or for uh, for the country. And um, I'm proud to say that uh, the team is about 90% females and they are all, um, they come from different backgrounds, uh, molecular biology to genetics to, to virology and immunology. They were working during the lockdown 24-7, uh, uh, leaving their families behind, and uh, because we th there was little known about the virus, so um, they had we all had to take precautionary measures uh, to protect our families. Now, these data was published, um, um, and you can see it online. Um, the test is is very sensitive, very reliable, and very fast. And the best of all is using common reagents found in any lab. So in any developing countries or low income countries who don't have those um, um, uh, opportunities to get these expensive kits, they can, they can utilize our protocol and, um, and, and do the testing. So we're proud of that. But that gave us the fundamental tools to use that for other questions such as to look at the viral load measurements and correlate it with the disease severity. So we now know for a fact that viral load uh, levels can predict the outcome of uh, disease severity. The predictive marker, marker that you mentioned, um, so we wanted to, as you, as you are aware, aware, there's many challenges in COVID research. Um, you want to identify asymptomatic versus those patients who will develop to, um, to um, uh, severely ill uh, conditions or develop mild to moderate symptoms. We don't know. So it's, it's physicians here, uh, first liners, whenever they have a, a positive, uh, positive uh, SARS-CoV patient, they just keep watching until you know, they, they give them the best medication. What we wanted is to study predictive markers. And this is uh, basically using proteomic analysis um, in different categories of patients, um, asymptomatic versus uh, mild, moderate, and severely ill patients. Look at all these proteins products that are distributed among this uh, population and try to identify a marker that can be used as a monitoring system um, for disease progression or even outcome of the disease and possibly a therapeutic. And I'm, I'm happy to, to say that we have so far found six possible markers that can predict SARS-CoV uh, outcome. Uh, but again, um, this is at, at, at its early stages and it needs to be validated in a larger cohort and um, to give that uh, outcome. I think, I hope that I answered your question. Absolutely, thank you um, yes. so much, Dr. Maha. In fact, um, you, you altered other questions in my head and other, you know, um, not questions, but like inquiries because we are, we are all very interested to understand how come uh, some get it so severely and some don't even feel it whatsoever. Um, and, and, you know, again, like, like I mentioned at the beginning, this is the magic of science. Uh, 
and the wonder of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like you, you, you really never know. And thank you very much for your insights. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions during the Q&A as well. Dr. Sabah, yes. following on Dr. Maha's um, insights on, on asymptomatic and the different ways of testing and, and, the, and the, um, the, the, the data and, and the research that we have come and the results that we've come upon, your research is, um, is associated between obesity and COVID-19. Um, and I've seen a lot of cases where we, uh, we basically, you know, we hear of people uh, uh, catching COVID-19 and then a few days later actually passing away, losing their lives. And they say, oh, because he was or she was obese. Um, you have uh, specifically also uh, uh, tackled the regulation of the receptor of the virus, uh, which is called, and, and please uh, correct me if I'm, uh, if, if I mispronounce, uh, 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 um, angio uh, or angiotensin, right? Um, <laughs> yes, converting enzyme two. Uh, there a connection, is there a connection between both? And do, do patients uh, uh, fare, you know, or, or are they far worse if they're obese? Because we have heard some of, 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 of these cases. And for the less scientific audience uh, out there, like myself, um, who really want to understand, you know, uh, in, in, in common English or in common language, tell us more about the, your research in simple, simple terms. Um, because uh, truly it's, it's fascinating how, you know, it, it differs from one person to the other. The floor is yours, Dr. Saba. Thank you so much, Marianne. So, yeah, exactly. So in the early days of the pandemic, it was actually quickly noted that people infected with the virus and who were categorized as we call them obese didn't do as well. Um, they had much more severe uh, symptoms. Um, in terms of recovery, they didn't recover well, and this all led to a uh, increased risk of mortality. And I've always been interested in the effect of obesity in respiratory conditions, like I said. Um, uh, so actually I was granted through the L'Oreal UNESCO uh, on my project on the role of obesity in, in, in asthma and its effect on steroid responses. So obviously when I saw the data relating to obesity and COVID-19, I was immediately drawn to studying the reasons why obese individuals were more affected um, during this pandemic. And what we found actually was that patients who were categorized as obese had a much higher level of the receptor uh, that the SARS-CoV-2 virus uses to enter the cells of the lungs. And this is this receptor, as yourself and, and Dr. Habiba have already mentioned, is called the ACE2 receptor or angiotensin um, uh, converting enzyme 2. And what we also found was that obesity seems to lead to a dysregulation of pathways which could actually affect host defense. And this data, we actually were able to publish it very recently in, in a, in a uh, journal called Frontiers in, in Physiology. And so we believe that this may explain why obese individuals are at an increased risk uh, for complications, but definitely there's a lot more to be studied in terms of these specific uh, patients who are obese or, or, um, uh, or morbidly obese. I hope I answered the question. Um, I will I will stop here and take one question from the audience and then I will get back to my own uh, drafted questions if you don't mind because it's 1246. There is a question from the audience and please feel free uh, from our uh, three uh, distinguished panelists feel free to to take the question or the three of you I mean it's open to it's not addressed to a specific speaker with how how fast the virus is spreading? What are the chances of an antigenic shift happening? And God forbid, make the virus more uh, uh, virulent. Um, anyone um, can, can, can uh, take this question, please, if you don't mind, it's open to the three speakers. Okay, I can um, answer I this question. Go ahead, Dr. Okay. Habiba, thank you. Yes, please. So um, the... Um, the speed of spreading the virus it depends on many many you know aspects. First of all, um, there is a two strain or let's say mutation. There is a D and G mutation. So uh, the G mutation what happened in Italy and UK it was a fast transmission. So it can uh, transmit faster. 
and the D it's very slow. So, um, uh, but there is kind of, there is a rationale behind the quarantine between seven or to 12 days. Uh, people, we notice the people who uh, get the disease from the infected from day one, they can transmit uh, faster. But after the quarantine, if they are positive, they can transmit it, but slower, not higher. Uh, then there is the, the things that the people, they, they take precaution for um, stopping the transmission, like wearing masks, wearing you know, gloves, and being very in a social distance. That slow down the transmission as well. It depends. So again, it depends on the virus strain. It depends on the environment as well. It depends on um, you know, um, uh, the, the, the social distance and the behavior or lifestyle of an individual. I agree. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Habiba. Dr. Maha, would you like to add anything? I think she covered it up, Dr. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. We have, a, we have a question actually addressed to uh, Dr. Saba uh, from Dana. Uh, doctor, uh, she, she says, thank you, Dr. Saba. Would losing weight reverse the complicating effect? That's actually a very good question. Um, so data from animal models, at least, shows that, yes, uh, weight loss can uh, revert uh, the ACE2 expression back to a normal uh, level. Um, and it would be, and in general, weight loss has been shown to um, lead back to that balance of the immune system. So uh, we would suppose that in this uh, current pandemic, that if an individual were to lose weight, yes, it, it does seem to have an effect on ACE2 expression, at least, like I said, from animal model studies. If I can add to um, Dr. Saba, also we've seen it in the stool samples, the viral load uh, between people who are very active, physical, they do, they are athletes, the viral load in their stool, so the body is the, uh, trying to get rid of the virus, it's higher, and with the people also who is uh, who are eating, fiber intake is high, then we see it that they are recovering really faster as well. And um, while well, uh, losing weight, or let's say being in a normal uh, BMI, we've seen it as well uh, among asymptomatic. And also the viral load was really extremely higher than the day loads because it's like they are trying, uh, the virus is trying to escape the body basically. That's very interesting, Dr. Habiba, in fact. So, so more exercise, you know, obviously if you're, if you're, if you're healthier, uh, it gets better, but even the the fiber element of it, you know, I was not aware of that. That's very interesting. I have a I have a question for Dr. Maha, and I I am going to shift a little bit uh, from pandemic to uh, focusing a little bit on the academic level of of uh, uh, of science and uh, and women in science and girls aspiring to be in the science uh, or the STEM industry. Uh, Dr. Maha, you are. Um, you are a women empowerment advocate, and I saw it in, in you know, uh, during our call, you were very passionate about that. And um, on an academic level, and particularly after the leader of one of the most prestigious universities, which you have, um, uh, you have attended, Harvard University, uh, and studied there. In, um, I was doing my research, and in, in, I, I came across that it, in, in the US in 2009, 2012, um, in an um, unguarded moment, uh, questioned the scientific abilities and passions of women. He opened the door to questions about obstacles uh, that women face in the sciences. Um, if that's the kind of stuff that someone like that is thinking, you have to wonder how many people are thinking the same thing. He, he was actually the head of Harvard University. Um, and not so long ago, uh, during the, um, the millennial years. Um, how do you, you know, I just wanna, I don't have particularly a question here, but I, I just want to really take your insight on how can we break the barrier or the stereotypes of um, the academic uh, field, particularly for women in academia? Um, I have uh, moderated a few sessions uh, during uh, uh, my time, and um, I have encountered uh, challenges and obstacles from professors 
where they say, if we do not put the extra time in our research hours, we do not get to be called professor. We are usually left as assistant professors or, um, or you know, for years and years and never even get to the level of seeing uh, professorship. Uh, just because they don't have the actual time that the men or the male encounter has to put in the library and to put in the studies and the research hours and hours and hours, not taking account that they are mothers, not taking account that they are daughters, that they are yeah. wives, etc. Mm. Okay, we have too many questions there. <laughs> okay, so. Um, it's disappointing to hear such cool, you know, uh, remarks and stuff like that. But I don't think this is you can um, um, say it to that everyone agrees with it. Not everyone agrees with it. So the when I advocate for women empowerment in STEM or young girls in STEM, the challenges um, that we face as women or young girls is different from country to country. And I think that we've seen that in the US, the number of uh, women in science, the, the graduates are there, but they tend to decrease in, in during the workforce. And um, in our case, it's very promising. As I said, and I mentioned earlier, 90% of the uh, researchers on COVID here right now at King Faisal at the research center is 90%. So they are committed. And I think there's many factors that contribute to this is the family support, the environment supports their career development. Um, so we, are, we have advantages uh, compared to other countries in the Middle East, especially in the GCC region. We have support systems, we have family. Um, so I don't think that is the case. In, in, and whenever you hear these disappointing remarks, we just uh, try to, uh, you know, um, ignore it. Uh, the second thing that I would like to say is that um, the best way to support women in their career in science is the best mentorship mentorship program or being role models to the young generation. And this is where we um, as scientists should uh, give out to, to the young generation. So I hope I answered your question. Absolutely, uh, Dr. Yes. Maha. Dr. Saba, you were nodding your head. Would you like to comment? I feel like you have something to say. <laughs> but you're you're muted. You're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, I was just nodding because I definitely agree with Dr. Maha about the role of of mentorship. Um, you know, a mentor is not just somebody that can guide you throughout your career and, and select the best career pathway, but it's also somebody that understands you and understands your lifestyle. Um, and especially for yes. women, that, that's an important thing um, to, to really find that proper mentor is, is key, I think. So yeah. completely agree. I with agree. I agree 100%, Dr. Saba. We have uh, one more question from the audience. I keep shifting between the audience questions and, and our questions because I want to give a chance to the audience. It's an anonymous attendee. How promising is the new uh, Myrna vaccine since there has never been a Myrna vaccine approved for human use? Um, anyone would like to take this question? Um, I would like to comment on the, the vaccine development. I think um, it's, it's, it's very tricky to discuss uh, at this stage. Uh, most of the vaccines are right now in either clinical uh, trial phase two or three. So it is not, um, we cannot say a definite answer, give a definite answer regarding the safety or efficacy of any vaccine until further uh, notice. So, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Maha. Yes. I agree. It's it's way too yes. early to comment it's on way that. Way too early. Yes, be it yes. a scientist or not, really, we need to give them a chance to research a yes. little bit more. And we hope yes. that there is some positivity in the future. We do have another question. Did the situation for women in the scientific workplace change during the past few years? How so? I think this is a very generic um, question, uh, but perhaps, you know, I think what, we've see, what we are seeing here today 
with our distinguished speakers and our uh, six amazing uh, women in science and even over the past 22 years of women um, really taking uh, a, a, you know, the front line and, and taking the center stage when it comes to science and when it comes to STEM, especially in the past decade, I think it's an answer already to, uh, to this question. But if um, any of our uh, panelists uh, would like to answer from your own experience, maybe perhaps with your students or uh, with your mentees, if you would like to take that question. Anyone? Shall I take this question? You can, you can. <laughs> okay, um, well, um, as, I, as I mentioned, I've been teaching for the past 10 years, but I've been working so far in science in the major, you know, uh, genetic for 16 years. When I finished my um, master in genetic engineering, um, well, I couldn't find really a job because it's like, we don't have this field. It's not very familiar. We don't have jobs that, you know, you can practice or, you know, they were like, what is genetic engineering? Is it cloning? Is it? So um, then when I started, you know, working in forensic science, coming to the university, people are questioning what it's like, this genes is causing this disease. Uh, okay, um, I'm marrying my cousin and the awareness it's becoming yeah, anymore in the, in, in the region or in the society about genetic testing. And many girls, they came like, how can we major in this major? How can we get a master's degree in genetics? What is genetic counseling? And when COVID-19 happened, many requests from female especially, how can we get into this major? I, I see a lot of change, a big jump, and also in numbers. Um, um, as Dr. Amaha mentioned, 90% of her staff is female. Also in, in my lab, I have only one male in the, in the lab. So we can see here in the region, it's kind of an opposite than the Western countries. Many uh, female, they tend to go into the STEM and science. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we are very lucky to be here. And um, I'm, I'm gonna speak about myself. I'm very lucky to be uh, from United Arab Emirates, born here, raised here, and with the leadership, with the empowerment of women, uh, that they give us all the opportunity to, to help us and to um, excel in this in this field. There are a lot of program like L'Oreal Women for Science. It helped me to have a program called Summer Internship where we take young scientists for eight weeks to, to work on a research, on a research that is high prevalence in the UAE and then write a scientific report or sci a manuscript that it can be published in a really good journal. So that helped them to spread the word and you know see that it's rewarding to see something you published. As we say it in Arabic, it's like this is yani, a knowledge that generation and generation will benefit from them. Uh, so that's give them like, you know, an opportunity to help other women and also other girls, young girls to get into the STEM. Um, I can see increased number of females, especially in my, in my major, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Habiba, I would like to add to that. And quoting uh, uh, the, the press release that uh, has not yet been released or has been released, I, I'm not really aware, but in the Middle East, women account for almost 50% or more of the total STEM student population. In Saudi Arabia, 38% of the graduates in STEM were women. However, only 17% of the labor force were women. In the UAE, 61% of university students are female whereas Oman has 71% and Bahrain has 55%. So I believe there are a lot of, of um, women and young girls entering the STEM, um, the STEM world and the STEM field and industry. Um, so it, it's, it's really how to attract them to, to, to continue uh, their, their professional life and their careers. In, in the stem, but Dr. Maha had a comment. Please go ahead, Dr. Yes, Maha. I just want to comment during the COVID uh, lockdown and our research efforts. And as I said, um, the there was, I think we were like 90% female. Um, I have to correct this because I didn't want to be uh, so harsh on men, but there were 99.9% .9 women, only one guy. In the team so and I'm, I'm sure that he's hearing this uh, video 
um, it, it was an amazing uh, time. We, they're very passionate. I can see the passion in, in women in science. It's, it's changing dramatically and quickly. Um, and I think they can bring um, a, a brighter future, inshallah. Yeah. Um, I have one more question from the audience. Uh, is it probably that newborns get infected by the virus? Is it probable that newborns get infected by the virus? And how should the mother deal with the baby in this case? Um, so there's data that shows that the virus is transmitted through breastfeeding uh, um, and data shows that, uh, but again, nothing is yet known because some of the, uh, you know, the, um, during the COVID early stages, uh, lots of people just publish data and it might be not really relevant data or significant data because the sample size is small, but any data was uh, um, uh, wanted at that time. So we cannot rely on this until we have a better uh, sample size and, and larger cohort to answer such questions. So if I could just continue on what Dr. Maha said. Um, I remember in the early days of the pandemic, I was asked to comment on that. Not that it's my specialty at all, yes. but there was a study that came out in the early days of the pandemic, which was you know, very reassuring that when they looked at nine women in China, um, and looked mm -hmm. at the outcome of the, of, the, of the newborns, none of the newborns were infected. Um, and so I remember saying during that question, I was like, but this remains to be changed. We, only time can tell what's really going to happen. And as, as Dr. Maha just said, that there's new data suggesting that no, there can be, you can find actually the virus in, in whether it's in the umbilical cord or in the breast milk. Um, so I think only time can really tell us what's going to happen with these newborns um, in terms of this infection. Also, if the um, babies, they have a genetic disorder, let's say, for example, a bubble boy. Uh, so these kind of diseases um, can, it can happen in an inborn and then, you know, they get the virus and be severe. So it's possible there is a genetic disorder. Very, very interesting. Um, and, and again, we're, we're learning a lot. I have one generic uh, question before we close this session. In fact, I don't, I don't want to wrap up the session because I'm learning so much. It's very interesting um, and, uh, and extremely enlightening uh, and you know, such an honor to be among uh, amazing women in science and, and leaders in this industry. Um, it's such an honor for me as well to be moderating this, but I have a general question in the end. And then if we have more questions, I will entertain two more because I feel that we are really be, become, you know, we, we, you're raising awareness and you're educating the audience. What are some of your milestones that led, that led you to a career in, in, in science, in fact? And uh, what would you share with, with young female generations to encourage them to enter the, the, the magical world of, of the sciences? Um, you know, and, 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 and because what we, what the statistics that I've just shared, it shows that we have a lot uh, of, of students, the, the, the large population of, of students going into the STEM industry, studying STEM are, are largely uh, women. And Dr. Maha has, uh, has uh, rightfully mentioned, even Dr. Habiba, that um, women have taken the center stage throughout the research uh, post-pandemic uh, in the past few months. Um, how can we encourage them to continue after their studies to continue their careers in uh, science and in STEM? Uh, we, we can start with uh, Dr. Maha and then uh, Dr. Habiba and then Dr. Sabah, please. Okay, so regarding the first question, the first part of the question is, why did I pursue this, uh, the STEM? Career. I think it was early exposure in my um, um, schooling years. I think it was junior high. I had a really uh, nice uh, professor who, who was, who was a, a, a retired professor teaching biology at school and he inspired us. So that gives you um, role of role models or good mentorship um, gives you access or uh, exposure to STEM. And since that time, I was telling my parents that I wanna be a scientist, I wanna be a scientist. 
So again, and this is how important the exposure uh, at early age to different STEM careers and having the mentorship program at different levels, you can get the, the best result out of it. Um, the, the other part of the question is, remind me, how can we encourage uh, more young, uh, you know, young females to continue? In the work environment, yeah. Yes, to so, continue. So again, we have here, and I'm talking about Saudi Arabia and in general GCC, um, we do have the, you know, support system in education levels, scholarships and so forth. So that is fine. At the workforce, we need to create the right environment for them. For example, their mothers, they're, uh, they're gonna have kids. So they need to have um, the best uh, um, uh, child care system within their working environment, uh, working institute to leave their kids and go to work and uh, accessible to them. I think um, best mentorship program at early age. Um, and most of all is providing them uh, the leadership opportunity. And this is where the 2030 vision of his conference, uh, um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, is promoting women in leadership. So this is what we hope. Yes. Um, I, thank you, Dr. Maha. I believe you have really hit uh, on, on the nail when, when you mentioned your, your teachers in school. Yes. This is extremely important. Uh, the role yes. of, of teachers as mentors, as role model, models, as, as uh, people that you know, spend most of the hours of the day with our children and us as children, they are the ones that will inspire us to enter yes. uh, any field or to exit uh, uh, or Absolutely. to have interest from any field, yes. in fact. So Absolutely. we- you know, we, we stress on ministries of education and, and we stress on teachers and, uh, and mentors uh, during the school years to really nurture the young talent. And when you see a talent, um, adopt that talent and speak to the parents, um, give them, you know, give them solutions, give them platforms, avenues to nurture the talent and grow it. Uh, Dr. Habiba, yeah. how did you enter the world of science? Well, I have similar story like with Dr. Anaha. Um, my role model, or let's say mentor, was my high school teacher. She, um, she used to teach me physics. And then um, I really developed uh, an interest in, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, so I developed interest in, in science, but I also liked history. So. Uh, but for my passion for science became bigger and then I went to um, the science major again it was my teacher in high school and now I'm, I'm reading or you know the Emirati genome um, getting into deep with the science I'm linking to history the migration pattern in terms with the genetic profiling which the science support history which I combined both of them that I read a lot of you know books about history so I combined science and history and and I find that they are complementing each other. Um, in terms of supporting the girls, um, we, we need to have more programs to support young scientists, like you know, women in science that we have for scientists, for postgraduate, for PhD, also for at high school level, um, you know, age. Uh, these students, especially, they, they are very curious. They they love you know to ask a lot of questions. If we can catch their attention during high school, that will shape their future and in getting into the STEM like you know me and Dr. Maha we were in the same you know with the teacher the studying physics and they I mean they taught us science in a very fun and different way that's why we 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 liked science uh, there is a program called meet the scientist at younger age in grade four and seven uh, everybody they have this stereotype about being scientists like you know it's male um, kind of an image of Einstein messy you know these kind of stereotype can be you know eliminated at early stages so uh, the the program that I I mentioned summer internship that we developed for six years now it's been a very excellent uh, program uh, we 
we managed to change some of uh, you know girls uh, let's say uh, they, they pursue their postgraduate in, in different science major and also some of the you know um, medical school student who joined us and then they saw the importance of research so they combine research with also you know doing medicine and practicing medicine. Absolutely, uh, Dr. Habiba. I think nowadays and, and uh, before we hear uh, the story of Dr. Saba, which I'm very interested to know as well. Nowadays, I think science and healthcare has become the, uh, the um, if you want, the, the, the popular fields at the moment post COVID-19. Uh, they are the growing industries. We, we need more scientists and more um, passionate uh, uh, scientists and practitioners more than ever. Dr. Saba, how did you stumble upon or how did you enter the world of, of science? Well, I was born oh, into it. <laughs> I, uh, I, was, I was blessed to be uh, in a family where science has always played a major role. My dad is actually a renowned uh, uh, researcher and so definitely I was bored into it no choice there um, and I'm actually um, the eldest of four girls I have no brother um, so I never you know my father always pushed us to pursue any career we wanted um, the sky was the limit I never heard the words well no you can't do that because you're a girl um, and so I, I have a daughter of my own and I I aspire to raise her in the way that that my father and my mother raised me uh, and by the way my mother is also a dentist so I really had no choice but to go into the world of science and um, you know I, I echo what uh, Dr. Maha and uh, Dr. Habiba said I'm I'm still relatively new I like to think of myself as young um, in the world of academia and I, I've noticed the same trend. Anybody that ever approaches me to, you know, come and work over the summer or or to work with me, it's always been women or or young girls. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to see that. But I, I think that what you said is very true. It's not just about getting the girls into, into STEM, but how do you continue? It's not easy. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example when the, when the COVID pandemic hit, um, and you might hear my son in the background crying. And that's just an indication of it, it's not easy um, to balance everything. Uh, but with the right support system, I think it's, it's definitely doable. Um, and when you get there, you really feel proud of yourself. Like sometimes at the end of the day, I think, oh my God, I've actually worked and I've put you know, food in my children's <laughs> tummies and I put them to bed. Um, but there's a lot that can be done. And I think it's multiple stakeholders that are really needed, whether it be the educational institutions, whether it be employers, government, and the broader society, um, you know, like you said, it really starts, I think, in the classroom and, and teachers have the power to really change that stereotype that we have about women in science. I was lucky to be part of with L'Oreal and UNESCO and Dr. Habiba and Dr. Maha, we were part of a, a, a awareness video, which we were asking young children, you know, can you identify a female or tell us about a female scientist or, and it was really sad to see that the kids, well, and no matter what age they were, they were not able to really name any women scientists and easily uh, could, could identify a male scientist. Um, so awareness about what the options are for, the, for these young uh, researchers. I think also we need to have programs in place such as L'Oreal UNESCO to promote these, uh, these wonderful minds. You know, it's, it's not a question of ability, it's definitely not. Um, and you know internships that that really are geared towards towards women uh, in, in science can be hopefully helpful too. Absolutely, thank you so much, Dr. Saba. And I really, you know, again, I want to reiterate what I said before. It's such an honor to be among uh, such accomplished, but also humble, down to earth, grounded, and inspiring women uh, as such. Uh, hearing your son in the background crying. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, honestly, it, it, it even inspires more and more uh, 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 young and older females to take on the world. There, you know, the sky is not the limit. And with, with having the chance to become change agents, to become change makers, to make a difference with humanity, to make a difference with one person even, is, uh, it's, um, I think it's, um, it's worth really uh, going through 
everything the entire day, like you mentioned, Dr. Sabah, going through the entire day and, and saying, oh, you know, my kids are still alive. They're fed, they're showered, they're in bed, they're good. Um, so it, it doesn't come easy. It comes with hard work. And I salute you, ladies. Um, and I thank you so much for your time. We are getting so many comments, amazing comments, um, wonderful comments, um, honoring you and thanking you and thanking L'Oreal and thanking UNESCO and she is Arab for this wonderful webinar. Uh, you have uh, mentioned something, Dr. Sabah, and it's very, very important. I would like to stress on it. Uh, with, with, um, with the pandemic, we have seen the power of the private sector coming together, joining hands with the nonprofit sector and the civil society and the healthcare sector to, uh, to, to save lives. Uh, we're not even talking about you know, anything big or to save lives. The power of the private sector and the true engagement of the private sector is huge. Uh, looking at the sustainable development goals that are 17 goals, I believe the, the, the most important goal of the UN SDGs is the 17th goal because it's partnership. And with the power of partnership, we can move mountains, we can do a lot. I salute L'Oreal Foundation for creating and co-creating with UNESCO this opportunity a long time ago, decades ago, to honor and to acknowledge women in the STEM industry and in science. And I would like to quote uh, the, the woman of science herself, uh, Marie Curie, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. And we are here to understand how this magical world is actually working. Uh, our bodies, how do they work from genetics to obesity, to as, uh, uh, asthmatic, to, um, to testing, to so many um, questions um, from, from us and down to our children. Um, we need to see more and more of uh, L'Oreal Foundation and UNESCO's, you know, hundreds of these partnerships get created to, to encourage more action and advocates. Um, with that, I thank this partnership and I thank this opportunity and this webinar. And I would like to leave the final remarks to Dr. Anna Paulini and to thank you for uh, this wonderful opportunity for us to, to, uh, to be among amazing women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I mean, we should thank you, you know, our distinguished panelists. I mean, uh, that the, the, there's been such an inspiration, you know, your wording, uh, the fact that at the end you are women, so you are very focused on your work, but you have also, you know, we are sort of multitasking. We have families to take care, extended families and so on. And sometimes, uh, as, as some of you mentioned, that's not easy and we sh should not give that for granted as well. So I really encourage you to be an inspiration for the young generation. You know that sometimes scientists do not talk science. Uh, uh, you all in your field, you are, uh, you know, excellence, you know, uh, people, but, you know, reach out really to the young girls. We need to inspire them from the young generation. You all mentioned there is a teacher, there is someone in your families. It can be an encounter. It, it really shaped all of us. We all have a story, right, uh, uh, to, that, that, that inspire us who, who we are uh, at, at this moment. So we really count on you. And that's why also this network is so important. And this platform that L'Oreal and UNESCO is, is, is really growing in, in the world is because of you uh, becoming really an inspiration for the new generation everywhere in the world we need more science and we need more women in science so thank you very much to all of you it has been fantastic and thank you to miriam for doing a fantastic job and in, 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 in managing the discussion thank you dr anna and thank you our our attendees and our participants for your for listening for inquiring and for uh, being here. Uh, I thank once again Dr. Maha, who has uh, left the camera, but I, I, you know, this is, the multitasking is happening. She's actually in the clinic. <laughs> She's saving lives as we speak. Dr. Maha, you're muted. Thank you, Dr. Habiba. Thank you, Dr. Sabah. 
It has Thank been you, such Maria. a pleasure, really. And, Not uh, the clinic, the lab. The lab. Keep inspiring yes. <laughs> and um, keep um, raising awareness. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Tamara. Thank you, Samar. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.